I'm doing an interview and somebody goes, well, you know, you're one of those clean comedians, I almost bristle a little bit because to me that implies not as funny. And so the challenge for me has always been, okay, can I do it this way, but still make you laugh as hard as, as, as somebody working blue? Sometimes when you find a way not to say something, it's actually funnier than saying it. I was preparing a set for The Tonight Show and Lena was hosting and and it was back in the time where everybody in the country was filming the delivery of their kid. And, and I said, Jay, can I do a routine about filming childbirth? And he's like, nah, you know, man, I don't know. That's, you know, right up there close to the line. You got to be careful. So it became a challenge. I'm like, can I write a joke about this? And so the, the joke was, I said, everybody said, oh, you should film the delivery. It's such a beautiful moment. And I said, you know, I've seen those films. To me, it looks like a wet St. Bernard trying to come in through the cat door. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, there's nothing dirty there. You know, there's not, but you can just imagine this wet St. Okay, Bernard. Okay, all right, Jeff. Okay. <laughs> to me, that's actually funnier than saying what it really looked like. I only stopped you because I've only been on the other end of that. Sure, so right, I just, right. like, you know, I, I know what it feels like to have a St. Bernard yeah. try and get out of the cat door. <laughs> ah, that's awesome. It's my and Bialik's breakdown. She's going to break it down for you because you know she knows a thing or two. And now she's going to break down. Hi, I'm Ryan Bialik. And I'm Jonathan Cohen. Very excited to talk to the person we're going to talk to today, Jonathan. Jeff Foxworthy. Who's Jeff Foxworthy, Mayim? He is perhaps most famously known for being the stand-up comedian who also birthed the franchise You Might Be a Redneck If. He's one of the most respected and successful comedians in the country. He's also the largest selling comedy recording artist in history, multiple Grammy Award nominee, best-selling author of more than 26 books. He's in the Georgia Music Hall of Fame. He's hosted numerous television shows. Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader? The American Bible Challenge. What's it worth? He also has created games, Relative Insanity, Relative Insanity 2, and See What I Mean. He's a very, very funny man, naturally, but he's also a very thoughtful man. And we're going to talk to him about how he got started in comedy how he kept going in comedy, how he prioritized his family and still kept his career going, also his faith in God, his notion of how he was directed, essentially, to use his talents the way that he's used them, um, how parenting his children was affected by the way he was parented. I would say this is one of the deeper interviews that Jeff Foxworthy has done. And one of Jonathan's favorite things, can we make a legitimate stand-up comedian laugh. We'll let you listen to the episode and see if we did it. The answer is yes. Let's just give him the preview. The answer is yes. Mayim has him howling, and I'm uh, very uh, pleased and proud of her. <laughs> well, it is really a pleasure to welcome Jeff Foxworthy to The Breakdown. Break it down. When they asked me about doing this, I'm thinking, okay, they have talk to everybody they can think of on the planet Earth, and they've reached the bottom of the barrel. <laughs> and the next option is going outside on the street and stopping people on their way home from the grocery store. <laughs> I'm like, and I never get nervous about anything. I'm pacing. My wife's like, are you nervous to do this? Lesson? I know, but they're just smart. They're just, smart, you know. We could tell you six things about our personal lives together, and you'd be like, those are the dumbest people I've ever met. <laughs> I love that. We have the opposite question usually. Why? How do? How do? How is it that you want to talk to us? <laughs> well, that's kind of what I was thinking because I'm like, these are really smart people, and <laughs> I'm two decisions from drywalling. So, um, how did I end up on this podcast? Well, we we happen to love comedians. Jonathan and I love comedians. We're we're connoisseurs of a sort. And so um I actually am a huge fan of your serious um your serious comedy station because it was one of the only things I could listen to with my kids in the car that didn't have cursing and was giving them a good comedy education. Well thank you for 
I, I'm a huge fan of of your voice, first of all, and your your voice as a stage presence. Um, but Jonathan and I are are often really, really interested in, you know, people who make their living as public people who have to be funny or say funny things, but who also have very interesting lives besides that. And so we wanted to talk to you. Well, I, I, I am honored. Fire away. Okay. So there's many interesting things about you that I didn't know that that Valerie helped us prepare for this episode with. You worked at IBM. Yeah. Well, it it's that sounds more impressive than it <laughs> is. Um, I flunked out of college. Uh, I had to go. I didn't have money to go to college, so I lived at home and I worked full time in a grocery store. And I was going to Georgia Tech, which was a really hard school. And working concurrently full time, it just wasn't a good combination. So I flunked out. Well, I like to say they invited me to take some time off. And uh, and so I was working in a grocery store. You know, I'm like this 19-year-old kid working in a grocery store. And my dad worked at IBM. And I'm sure he called one of his buddies and said, Hey, my my kid's working in a grocery store. Give him a job. So I started out in dispatch. I was answering telephones uh, and sending repairmen to calls. And then after about a year or two, I took an aptitude test and they said, oh, you'd be good at fixing things. So I, I, I wore a suit and tie, but I carried a tool bag and I repaired machines. And so, you know, it wasn't quite as glamorous as as it sounds. Well, but there there is a certain amount of of uh glamour and mystique to, you know, the computer age in the years that you're talking about. Um how big were these computers? Oh, you could crawl up inside of them. <laughs> I mean, I, they you know, people had computer rooms that were like super air conditioned and there were a lot of them I'd take the side panel off and crawl up inside of them and work on them. And now you know, your phone has more power than that computer did. Right. So. Um, so I'm I'm curious, um, were you funny? <laughs> like were you a funny guy? Yeah, I was always funny. I was I was funny as a kid, but I came from a funny family. Um you know, I'm like the seventh funniest person in my family. So when I go home for family reunions or Thanksgiving, there's zero pressure. You know, they all go can't believe you're making money doing this. Uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, and it, 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 as I've aged, I, I, I kind of landed on, I can't even, I get embarrassed when anybody compliments me, um, because I, I don't know why I can do this. I cannot organize my office but you could say, hey, Jeff, sit down and and write me a routine about home security and mm. and I could I could do it. I don't know why I can do it. It's just a gift that that God gave me. Like, you know, some people's gift is taking care of old people. Some people's gift is uh, laying laying stonework or whatever. It's so, yeah, I could just always make people laugh. You have two younger siblings, is that right? I do. I have a sister that's about a year and a half younger and a brother that's about five and a half years younger. And you were raised by your mom. Your dad lived in a different state, is that correct? Yeah, well, he, working for IBM, he lived in a different state a lot of the time, and then sometimes he lived in the same state. But, you know, my dad was a... My parents could not have been more different. My mom was... Don't drink, don't smoke, don't cuss, go to church five times a week. And my dad was married six times and had a thousand girlfriends in, be in between and wow. drank, smoked, cussed, and had Playboy magazines all <laughs> over his apartment. So, you know, as kids bouncing back and forth between the two of those, it, looking back, you're like, holy cow, that was a childhood of mixed messages. And also, um, not to age you, you're not a million years old. I mean, computers that you could crawl up into definitely indicates that you, you've you been alive uh, for a minute. We can age me. I'm 65. I just turned 65. So you're 65. So um, having parents that weren't together, especially in the South, I would imagine, was that unusual? Do, do you know, my, I, 
I was the first family that I ever knew of that was divorced. Huh. I, I remember my mom picked me up at piano lessons and said, I think my dad and uh, you, you, your father and I are getting a divorce. Huh. And I just remember riding home being horrified going, everybody's going to make fun of me. I don't know one other kid that has divorced parents. Did they make fun of you? I don't, not that I remember, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, it wasn't very common then. You know, it wasn't a, a common thing. So I'm sure I felt probably a little shame in that. Yeah. Um, you, was your, your dad was funny. I think I've heard you say that your dad was funny. Really funny. Really personal. Was your mom also funny? Yes, but in a different, in, in, in a, <laughs> in a much more subdued way. Uh, <laughs> but my dad was, you know, he was the guy at the bar that everybody was sitting around and he was telling the jokes and made everybody laugh. And yeah, he was a funny guy. So you're working um, at I at IBM, as you said, wearing a suit and carrying a toolkit, which is an adorable image. Um, <laughs> and um, the story that I've heard, is this true? Like you were encouraged to enter essentially a talent show? Well, OK, so I, I worked with a bunch of guys in Atlanta that used to go to the local comedy club, The Punchline. And they kept coming back to work and they were going, Foxworthy, you're funnier than those people there. You need to do this. And I was the guy, I I was the guy that was in the break room doing impersonations of the boss and then <laughs> turning around and the boss was in the doorway. I was that guy. So I wasn't on the on the fast track to be promoted. And so the contest they entered me in, it wasn't an amateur night. It was a it was called the Great Southeastern Laugh Off. It was a contest for working comedians. And so I was like, oh crap. I, and so I went and watched one week and I said, okay. And I went home and I wrote, you know, five or six minutes about my family. And I went back. And the first time I ever did it, I was terrified, but I won the contest. And and I remember thinking an hour and a half into it, oh my gosh, this is what I want to do with my life. You wow. Know? And I told, I, I went up amateur night for a couple of more months. Um, and I I told my mom, I said, I, I'm, I'm going to quit IBM. I, I'm going to try this. And her first question was, are you on the dope? What, <laughs> whatever the dope is. Uh, <laughs> And I, and I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm not on dope. I I think I can do this. And then five five years later, I was on Johnny Carson, and um, the same mother said, you know, you wasted all those years at IBM. <laughs> I'm the Alex Breakdown is supported by Ritual. Did you know, ninety five percent of pregnant women are not getting their recommended daily intake of key omega threes. Enter Ritual. Their prenatal contains 350 milligrams of eco-friendly vegan omega-3 DHA in every serving sourced from algal oil instead of fish. Did you know it's important to take a prenatal multi before you're pregnant? The first 28 days of pregnancy are so important to baby's neural development, so there's really no such thing as too soon to start. And with supplements, less can be more. Many vitamin brands contain excess nutrients that our body just doesn't need. Rituals Essential for Women is research stacked and science backed. It is easy and painless to incorporate ritual products into my daily routine, and I especially love that they're vegan friendly. Ritual's prenatal multivitamin is made traceable with vegan bioavailable and clinically studied key nutrients before and during pregnancy, like omega-3 DHA to support baby's brain development, and choline and methylated folate to support baby's neural tube development. Capsules feature a delayed release design to help make it gentle on an empty stomach, and a citrus essence makes taking your multis actually enjoyable. Rigorously tested and validated by a third party for allergens, microbes, and heavy metals, Ritual works with world-class certification bodies to validate their products. Products. Ritual multivitamins are vegan, non-GMO project verified, gluten and major allergen free, certified B Corp and made traceable. Why settle for a multivitamin you're not 100% sure about? Ritual was literally built on trust, so you know it's the real deal. Get 20% off your first month for a limited time at ritual.com slash breakdown. Start Ritual or add Essential for Women prenatal to your subscription today. That's ritual.com slash breakdown for 20% off. 
My and Bialik's Breakdown is supported by BetterHelp. Two of the most important relationships I am proudest of in my life are the ones I share with my two kids. It's not something that always came naturally to me. I've worked long and hard on myself and my relationship with my kids to make it what it is today. A common misconception about relationships is they have to be easy to be right. But you know what? Sometimes the best ones happen when both parties are putting in the work to make them great. Therapy can be a place to work through challenges you face in all of your relationships, whether with your kids, friends, parents, work colleagues, your significant spouse, anyone. Therapy has been critical, not only for me better understanding myself, but understanding how I relate to other people. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch at any time for no additional charge. Become your own soulmate, whether you're looking for one or not. Visit betterhelp.com slash break today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash break. Jeff, when you go and you get up on stage and you've written five minutes, like there's a big difference between telling jokes in a break room or to your friends and then like structuring it into material for the stage. It sounds like that transition just like you didn't... uh, like you just knew how to do that. Was there, was there like the practice of like, oh, how do I take this stuff I'm doing over here and make it stage ready? Well, you know, Jonathan, as a kid, as a little kid, I would save my allowance and I would buy comedy records. Mm-hmm. I bought Flip Wilson records and Bob Newhart and Bill Cosby and it, the later on Carlin and Pryor. But I would memorize them in like a day. I would just play them over and over and I'd memorize them and and I would go to school and do them and, you know, make the other kids laugh because, you know, it was, if if I had to analyze it, it was like a power. People liked the funny kid. You know, the funny kid was the popular kid. And so I had listened to so much comedy by the time I did it. I think I had an innate idea. Oh, this is this is how you tell a story like that. And and obviously, you know, hopefully I've I've gotten better at it since that time. But but I had enough of an idea of how to put together a comedy set. Was there any notion of, you know, you named some comedians who are you know, obviously very well known. And, um, you know, those records played in in my house when I was a kid. Uh, my brother, you know, we, we listened to Steve Martin and, and you know, all those kinds of things. Um, was there any sort of sense of like, I'm a kid from Georgia and I'm sort of adapting this to make it my own? Like, did you have a notion of like, that's a very different world? You know, the comedy clubs of of the North and of New York and of Chicago was there any kind of, you know, interesting reflection you had at that point that might have been a foreshadowing of like, I'm going to do my own brand of this, essentially? I mean, you, you've you created essentially a comedy empire based on the specificity of the culture that you grew up in. Um, not immediately. Uh, at, at the onset, at, at, at that first night, I just wanted to make people laugh. Um but as I started, I had a very strong work ethic. I, I would go, I, I did year after year after year doing 500 shows a year because I, I, you know, it's almost like the Malcolm Gladwell do something for 10,000 hours and you become an expert at it. And, but as I, I would go to New York a lot and, and, and I would get advice like, um, Look, Jeff, not for none, right? I don't want to hurt your freaking feelings, but you you got to take some voice lessons and lose <laughs> that stupid accent you got. And and it was just, you know, and, and in my mind, I'm thinking, well, where I come from, you have the stupid accent. But, uh, but it was just trusting your intuition. And my intuition was, well, at least a quarter of the country talks this way. Why do I have to change the way that I talk? Hmm. And, you know, it's it's probably where the redneck jokes came from, because I, I drove a pickup truck and I'm driving all over the country, but I, I wore blue jeans. Uh, I grew up fishing and, and, and deer hunting and, you know, vegetable gardens. And and so as I would 
and I talked like this. So as I would go around the country, it was good natured. But, you know, I'd be in Chicago and they'd be laughing at me going, Foxworthy, you're nothing but an old redneck from Georgia. And one night I'm playing just outside Detroit in a little suburb called Livonia. And they're kidding me after the show about being a redneck. Well, the club we were playing in was attached to a bowling alley that had valet parking. (laughs) And and I said, wait, if you don't think you have rednecks in Michigan, (laughs) let's all go look out the window. People are valet parking at the bowling alley. And... I went back to the hotel that night and I wasn't smart enough to think, oh, this is going to be a hook or it'll end up being books or calendars or anything. I was just trying to write stand up. And kind of the premise was, look, I know what I am, but apparently a lot of people don't. And I wrote 10 ways how to tell how you might be a redneck. but, But what I found when I was doing them People were laughing and then they were turning around and pointing at somebody, you know, in their group. And I'm like, oh, wow. You know, maybe there's something here. I I wanted to go back when you said that, you know, the first set of jokes that you told us about your your family. You know, Jonathan and I get some of our best material from our families. What what did you what did you talk about? Like, what were the first things that you thought this is how? I put myself on stage. Like what, what was funny? You know, I, uh, and, and, and boy, this is aging myself, but, and I don't think you're quite that old, but, but I grew up in the age where people smoked all the time. So people had ashtrays all over their house. And, uh, one of the first things I talked about was how fathers, when they, cut their toenails, they don't throw them in the trash can. They leave them in the ashtray in the den for the entire family <laughs> to admire. Uh, and and that big toenail looked like you need bolt cutters to get it <laughs> off with. And um, <laughs> so that was, that was the first thing. But, you know, like I listened to you um, talking to Bob Odenkirk and, and, and talking about like his influence with... Um, Monty Python and all, and talking about the different kinds of comedy. Yeah, I think I was very fortunate in that very early on, I found what, I found that um, template that worked Mm. for me. And, And the idea was, if I think something, or if my wife says something, or if my family does something, I am going to trust that other people are thinking and saying and doing the same thing. Um, that's that's how I'm going to make that common thread. I'm going to trust if I think it, other people are thinking it. If she says it, other people are saying it. And that's what worked f- for my style of comedy. Because the biggest compliment to this day that I can get is somebody coming backstage after the show and going, oh my God, you've been in our house. Oh, oh my God, you've been on the road with us because, you know, you've taken part of their life that they never thought about it being funny and you've kind of showed it to them and and they're laughing basically at themselves. There's something that came up in actually in the Bob Odenkirk episode that that I wanted to ask you about. Um, You know, I I have a 15 and an 18 year old and, you, you know, Jonathan has a teenager as well, and you've had kids, you're a grandpa. There's this sort of like moment in time, I'm imagining, when you go to your mom, you know, or when you have that feeling on stage of like, I think I want to do this, right? And you go to your mom and like, it makes me choke up a little bit because we think of all the things that our kids want, the things that our kids dream of, you know, the things that our kids bring to us. And I wonder... I wonder if you can identify two things. What was it in you that really believed you could do it and that it wasn't just like, I want to be an astronaut or like, I'm going to be the president of the United States, which apparently anybody can do. I don't know. But- well, I'm, I'm 65. I've got 15 more years before I'm eligible <laughs> to be president. So. True story. <laughs> so I want to know two things, though. I want to know what was it in young Jeff 
that felt like this is something I can say out loud because the notion of like imposter syndrome, like that looms large, I think for, for many of us who have dreams that are bigger than what, let's say we thought we were programmed for. But I also want to know what was that like for you as a young person to bring that to your mom and be able to support that? Like, how did you know? And what if you were wrong? Maybe you're still wrong. Well, yeah, I've, I've, I might be wrong. You know, I, I, I used to say I, I never would want to be psychoanalyzed about why I do what I do because maybe then I couldn't do it anymore. Uh, Welcome to our podcast, Jeff. Yes. <laughs> y- you know, I, I, and and maybe every human being feels this way. Um. Like I remember being a little kid in church and I knew that I loved God, but all the people in church were marching in this straight line, you know, behavior wise. And I knew at seven years old that I was wired like this. And so that became a dichotomy for me. And I'm like, God, I really, I, I love you, but I'm not wired like this. I'm, and it, it took, it took a long time in life for me to kind of reach the point where it was like God saying to me, look, I know that you're made like this because I made you like that. And it's okay. I don't need all of that. And so I guess I always felt like maybe I was a little bit different, you know, and I, and I would tell my kids the whole time growing up, I said, you know, if you're going to have a full life, you, you need to have a few hold your nose and jump moments. You, you need to just not know that there's a safety net there and, and hold your nose and jump. And I think that was, that was probably my thought with quitting IBM was, and my, this is, this is interesting because as I was contemplating it, two things happened. One, the, the very night that I won the contest, I also met my wife, who was an actress and was there to root for somebody else. And so we literally met that night. And um, so she saw me from the very first time I ever did it. But we started going out and she was the only person saying to me, you know, you you've got all of this stuff down inside of you. And if you don't find a way to get it out, you're going to, you're going to have a pretty miserable life. You do not need to be sitting in a cubicle. You're, you're too creative for this. And so she was the voice um, that was encouraging me. And I also remember as I was contemplating it, I was sitting in the break room one day, I was sitting by myself, but a couple of tables away there were, and I'm at, you know, I'm 24 at the time. But at this other table, there were guys in their 60s, and you can't help but kind of overhear them. And one guy was saying, man, I wish I'd have had a hardware store. I would have loved to have had a hardware store. And another guy going, yeah, you know, I always thought about starting my own business, refinishing cars. Or, and, and I just remember, like it was yesterday, having the thought, holy cow, I don't want to be sitting in this break room. 40 years from now thinking, I wish I had tried to be a comedian. And so my thought was, I'm going to hold my nose and jump. And if it fails, what's worst case? I come back with my hat in my hand and beg for the job back, you know. And my my goal was to be able to do it for two years because I thought when I got old, it would be a cool story to tell my grandchildren like, hey, I was I was actually a comedian for a couple of years. Somehow, two has now turned into 40. Um, so, gosh, I, I'm you know, I don't know in my wildest dreams did I ever think that that I would be doing it this long. But I, but I've so enjoyed it. I feel like one of the most blessed people alive because I've made a fabulous living doing something I would have done for free. Also, I want to, I want to, you know, mention your, you know, your, your empire, your comedy empire. It's, it's not just you on a stage, you know, you, 
You have branched out. You've written, is it 26 books? Something like that. 26. Something like that. Yeah. And, you know, there's there's an entire, you know, there's an entire universe of things that people identify you with. Um, you know, whether it's, are you smarter than a fifth grader or... Um, like when COVID hit, I started inventing games. Called that, well, that's where, that's where I was going. So, yeah, t- tell me how that came about. Um, I- I'm particularly interested, well, Jonathan and I both love games, but I'm particularly interested in see what I mean. So I'd like you to tell us about why you started creating games and sort of how it combines your comedy sensibility with this format. Okay, so the original one, what my family, we're big on tradition. So at Thanksgiving every year, I have a farm about an hour south of Atlanta. And so every year at Thanksgiving, we have like 30 people, cousins, relatives, grandparents, aunts and uncles. We all do uh, 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 days at a time doing Thanksgiving. And so at the Thanksgiving before COVID started, our kids who were now in their early 20s, that, that night they're sitting around the kitchen table and they're playing Cards Against Humanity and they're gut laughing. And I walk in there and I go, you, you, y'all need to go downstairs in the basement. You cannot, you, you cannot play this in front of your aunts and uncles and your grandparents because we're out in the country and it's hard to get an ambulance out of, out of here to take them to the hospital. And, and I thought, well, the, and I'm literally sitting there thinking, well, could you make a funny game that wasn't filthy? That that was that was. And so I went in my office where I keep um, I'm sitting. I keep stacks of note cards everywhere. And I got a couple of packs of note cards and I sat down and I wrote 500 punchlines, <laughs> not setups, just punchlines. And like give give us an example. Like give us a couple examples. I have mold in my crawl. I have mold in my crawl space. Uh, <laughs> m- my mom said the same thing. You know, or <laughs> j- just things that sounded funny. Um, and I, I'm not wearing any underwear. You know, so so it might be. And then I I did like a hundred setups that were all about relatives. So the setup, it's the simplest game in the world is everybody has seven punchlines in their hand and somebody reads the setup and it's like right before daddy walked me down the aisle, he leaned over <laughs> and whispered, you know, I have mold in my cross I'm not, I'm not wearing, wearing an underwear. I'm not wearing any underwear, you know, what? It, and, and so people just throw down the punchline they think is going to get the biggest laugh. And it's you learn to play it in 10 seconds. But so I wrote, you know, I wrote out this stack of note cards. And then I, the next day I got the family around and said, sit at the table. We're going to try this, see if this works. <laughs> and I've recorded on my phone and they're all gut laughing. And I'm like, crap, I think I just made up a game. Um, and so it's called Relative Insanity. And um, that's how the whole thing began. And then see what I mean was just kind of doing the same thing with pictures of families and, you know, creating punchlines and things. And so, you know, it's, it's a weird gift. I don't know why I can do it. And now a word from our sponsor, Betterment. Let's talk about you and your money. You like your free time. You like to relax every now and then. You like to feel totally chill. But your money? Your money likes to work. And Betterment is the automated investing and savings app that makes your money hustle. While you're catching up on sleep, your money's up early, earning 11 times the national average in a high-yield cash account. Your money's a multitasker, diversified in expert-built portfolios of low-cost ETFs. And your money's optimized with automated tax-efficient strategies, just like the pros use. Your money is a total workhorse, so you don't have to be. Because you've got Betterment, the automated investing and savings app that makes your money hustle. Visit Betterment.com to get started. Learn more about high-yield cash accounts at Betterment.com. Investing involves risk, performance not guaranteed, cash reserves offered through Betterment LLC and Betterment Securities. Betterment is not a bank. Mind the Alex Breakdown is supported by Audible, who lets you enjoy all your audio entertainment in one app. You'll always find the best of what you love or something new to discover. 
You can choose from so many titles on Audible, such as physical, mental, spiritual, social, motivational, occupational, and financial wellness. I highly enjoyed and really recommend Build the Life You Want, The Art and Science of Getting Happier by Arthur C. Brooks and none other than Oprah Winfrey. Audible offers an incredible selection of audiobooks across every genre, from bestsellers and new releases to celebrity memoirs, mysteries and thrillers, business, and more. They are the home of storytelling, offering thousands of titles. Audible helps you get closer to the voices that can change your life and lets you enjoy all of your audio entertainment all in one easy-to-use app, which is where I like to listen from. You'll find voices that motivate to spark you to take action. There are sounds to soothe so you can focus, reduce stress, and sleep better. Stories to inspire so you can dream big again, plus personalities to encourage and enlighten so you'll have a partner on your journey. You'll also discover thousands of podcasts, from popular favorites to exclusive new series, guided wellness programs, theatrical performances, comedy, and exclusive Audible originals from top celebrities, renowned experts, and exciting new voices in audio. The newly included selection of titles makes Audible membership so much more valuable and gives all members a chance to discover new favorites and new formats like the exclusive Words and Music series. As an Audible member, you can choose one title a month to keep from their entire catalog, including the latest bestsellers and new releases. You can download or stream their included titles all you want. New members can try Audible now free for 30 days. Visit audible.com mbb or text MBB to 500-500. That's audible.com slash MBB or text MBB to 500-500 to try Audible free for 30 days. What strikes me is that you have a level of openness with your creativity. A lot of people might be like, oh, I could create a game and sit down to write, but then second guess themselves or like, oh, this isn't good enough, but it sounds like you have a relationship or what strikes me about what you were saying is that you have a relationship with your creativity where it's just like an open channel. You're like, I'm just going to write these things. Like to sit down and write 500 for most creative people without that second guessing or editing isn't isn't very easy. Has it always been like that for you? A little bit. Um, you know, my brother, like I did the first You Might Be a Redneck Page a Day calendar in 1990. And my brother helps me with that. And he, he called the other day and said, hey, I, I, I'm going to need some for next year's calendar. Now, so 1990 was how long ago? 33 years ago. And I've and I've written 8000 of them. And 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 I sat down and, you know, got a, a notebook and I wrote one hundred and nineteen in a couple of hours, you know, and I'm like, hell, after this many years, and how can I still do this? But there's something, and maybe, Mayim, you can speak to this. There, as, as an actress, there's, see, I think most people have the thoughts comedians have, but they kind of go in one ear and they go out the other and we learn to grab, but there's something within us. And I think the same thing is within actors and maybe musicians where say somebody says something in public and you immediately think of some funny retort to it. I think most people keep their mouth shut. They think, Oh, that would be funny. And there's something within us that goes, I'm just going to throw it out there. And you know, not knowing when you throw it out there, is it going to get a laugh or is it not? But there's some boldness in us that goes, I'm going to throw it out there. I think it's the same thing with acting. I'm going to decide that this character does this. And it's, you know, it, it, there's something very instinctual within all of that, I think. Well, I think it's it's instinctual and it's also compulsive to a nature. Um, <laughs> yeah, probably. Because, yeah. you know, I, I'm thinking about Jonathan, who is a, a writer, but a very, very funny person. And Jonathan also, you know, there are certain people for whom the the, the filter is not as... Uh, it's not as thick as it should be. Sure. So Jonathan, Jonathan is famous for there is no time that he will not say the thing that is in his head that he wants to grab. Well, to the point that Mayim said about there is never not the right opportunity to make a joke. She t points out all the places that I should not be making jokes quite often. <laughs> And I was wondering, Jeff, do you have that? Or is if you're surrounded by funny people in your family, is it sort of, 
you have to te- you have to say the thing that's funny. It's like it's sort of the the rule. Like don't leave a joke on the table. Yeah, when when my wife first started hanging around my family, she was a little bit uh, aghast because like if if you have a zit on your forehead in my family and you walk out in the morning, somebody's going to say, "What up, Cyclops?" You know, I mean, it's not like they're going to ignore it and be nice. They're going to point out all of your flaws. They're going to make fun of them. And she's like, oh, y'all are so horrible to each other. <laughs> um, but but we're really not. I mean, it's like a love language for us. You know, it's like, hey, I know I still love you and you got a big old zit on your forehead. So uh, let's just acknowledge it. Yeah, let's acknowledge it so everybody in the room doesn't sit here and think it for the next three hours. Let's let's point it out. Is your wife not a Southerner? She's well, she is, but it's a different Southern. She's from New Orleans. Oh, is, very different. Yeah, very it, different. There's their French influence. They've got a lot of Creole things happen. It's a whole different culture. Yeah, it's the Heinz 57 thing going on there. <laughs> and she's she's funny too. Um but she's been, golly, for 40 years, this poor woman is it's me coming out of the shower going, hey, is this funny? And <laughs> you know, and her going, yes. And I'm like, wait, I haven't told you yet. Uh <laughs> <laughs> but I so trust her in that she she will go, yeah, there, there's something there. That middle part's not very good. Or she will go, yes, that's really funny. Or she will go, no, not funny at all. Uh, or she will say, okay, yeah, that's a, you're, that's a funny joke about women, but you need to balance it out with something about men. And so I, I really trust her instincts. On things. She, she, she's right more often than I am, which is part of what I think, I don't know about you, Jonathan, but one of the things that, and I've, I've been very blessed that I've gotten to do a lot of creative things and I enjoy doing different things. I, I enjoyed hosting the game show. I enjoyed doing sketch comedy. I enjoy writing. I paint, I draw, but the thing that fascinates, but out of all of them, stand-up fascinates me the most. And that is because you never get to the point that you have it figured out. After 40 years, I still do not know what people are going to laugh at. And I can take something that I think, oh, people are going to snot on themselves at this and go try it out in a club and it's crickets. And then I'll have something else that I think, well, this is stupid and throw it out there and people are beating the tables. And I'm like, and, and the audience is right. I mean, they're always right. But I'm like, crap, if I laid carpet for 30 years, I would know how to do a corner and how to do a step. And But, I, I, it, but that's part of what fascinates me about stand-up is crap, I can't figure it out. Does it change based on the audience? You know, like you say something in a southern city and you're like, oh, it got a great laugh or it was crickets. And then you're like, but maybe if I was in, you know, Boston, this might be a different reaction. How do you reconcile those two? You know, for for me, I don't really notice when I change geographics. I don't go talk about necessarily other things. Um, And I have a theory about human being i think for for the style of comedy i do that we're looking for that connection and i think if you gathered everybody in this country together and and sit and sat them down and said what is it that you want out of life i bet you and and i'm talking about pegging left and right politically i bet you people would agree on 85% of the same things and so that's what i look for even though, you know, my, you grew up Jewish, I grew up Christian, you grew up in California, I grew up in Georgia. I'm, I'm going to look for those things that we have in common. And, you know, it's, it's kind of funny because as a country now, we don't focus on that 85% we have in common. We focus on the 15% where we differ and we yell at each other about that. But you know, I think there's there's basic human wants and needs that that are universal. Um, 
you know, you want to be able to take care of your kids. You want to be able to eat today. You want to be able to get from point A to point B. And so th- that's the part of it that I tend to, it's like, I'll just stay in this lane. I don't, I don't want to do political humor. I don't want to do religious humor. I don't want to I don't want to go in those areas where we yell at each other. There's enough of that. I have a question about, um, you know, many of the comedians, I mean, a- almost all of the comedians that that many of us were raised with, um, you know, tend to be blue. They tend to be, uh, they tend to curse. They tend to talk about, you know, a variety of things that you kind of choose to stay away from and, you know, kind of even make a point about it. I wonder if you can talk about what that value is and what it means to you that you've had, you know, th- this kind of really beautiful success um, that has a lot of, you know, principle behind it in, in that sense. You know, my goal, again, I'm dating myself. My goal when I started out, I wanted to be on Johnny Carson. And I remember in 1984 sitting with Jay Leno at a Waffle House and Jay said to me, you know, if you work clean, you'll always work. And and he goes, you know, you can't be dirty in the clubs and then all of a sudden clean it up and be on the Tonight Show. It doesn't work that way. And I thought. "Okay, but but I was still kind of wired like that anyway. And. You know, there's there's something in me. I like doing things the hard way. Um, and I I just do. I don't I don't want to do it the easy way. I want to do it. The, and, and so to me, if I'm doing an interview and somebody goes, well, you know, you're one of those clean comedians, I almost bristle a little bit because to me that implies not as funny. And so the challenge for me has always been okay, can I do it this way, but still make you laugh as hard as is, is somebody working blue? That's the challenge. And sometimes when you find a way not to say something, it's actually funnier than saying it. I, I remember one night I, I, I was getting, uh, I was preparing a set for The Tonight Show and Lena was hosting and and it was back in the time where everybody in the country was filming the delivery of their kid. And, and I said, Jay, can I do a routine about filming childbirth? And he's like, nah, you know, man, I don't know. That's, you know, right up there close to the line. You got to be careful. So it became a challenge. I'm like, can I write a joke about this? And so the, the joke was, I said, everybody said, oh, you should film the delivery. It's such a beautiful moment. And I said, you know, I've seen those films to me. It looks like a wet St. Bernard trying to come in through the cat door. <laughs> well, there's, there's nothing dirty there. You know, there's not, but you can just imagine this wet St. Okay, Bernard. Okay, all right, Jeff. Okay. <laughs> but that was the challenge. It was like, and, and, and I called Jay and I said, can I do this joke? And he started laughing. He's like, yeah, you can do that. And, you know, so... To me, that's actually funnier than saying what it really looked like, you know. <laughs> that's great. I just, I only stopped you because I've only been on the other end of that. Sure, so right, I just right. like, you know, I, I know what it feels like to have a St. Bernard yeah. try and get out of the cat door. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that's awesome. Now, I wanted to ask if you if you see God in your life, meaning, you know, I love this notion of, you know, having acceptance that you're made different, meaning everybody's made different, but some more different than others. Yes. And, um, I wonder like, is that, you know, I'm, I'm a person of faith, so this is a safe place. I'm not asking from a, a hostile place. Um, I'm curious, do you feel guided? Do you feel a presence? Do you feel like blessed? Like, where does that sense of what you were destined for, like, where does that play into your life when you look at your career? <laughs> I remember saying to Ron White one time, I said, Ron, I don't understand. I said, you know, there were so many people that were funnier than me when we started out, and I don't understand why God let me be successful. And so many of those people went by the wayside. And Ron goes, 
That's because God knew you'd do the right thing with it, and the rest of us would just <laughs> smoke dope and watch cartoons. Uh, <laughs> but, I mean, I feel all of those things, Maya. I, I do feel blessed. I feel so lucky that, you know, I know there's people out there that are going to jobs that they hate every day. I've always loved what I do. I get to be creative, which was, but I believe that's the gift that I was given. You know, Mark Twain, there's a Mark Twain quote where he said, the two most important days of your life are the day you were born and the day you figure out why. Yep. And I think that's my why. It's like God said, all right, I'm going to let you be funny, but take the leverage that you get from this and use it for good stuff. Um. And that's what I've that's what I've tried to to do with my life is you know I left um, I left L A we were in L A and and I did get to do Johnny Carson but you know before before he left so I remember going home that night and staring at the ceiling and going oh my gosh I have no plan that was it that was all uh, but other things came along and I did a sitcom which. Out of everything I've done, I probably enjoyed that the least. I feel you. <laughs> but once I had kids, I wanted my kids to grow up around their family. And so we left L.A. and came back to Georgia. And pe- agents and managers were saying, you're killing your career. You're killing your career. And I'm going, well, I might be. I hope not. But they're more important than this, you know. I, I remember doing an interview several years ago, and the and the lady that was interviewing me, she said, okay, you do stand-up, you paint, you draw, you write books, you make up games. Which one are you? And I kind of laughed, going, well, oh, yeah, that's an interesting question. And I said to her, I said, well, all these things you named, those are things that I do, and I love what I do, but who I am and what I do are not the same thing. Who I am when you say which one are me, who, who who I am is, is I'm a husband and I'm a dad and I'm a brother and I'm a son and I'm a friend and I'm a child of God and I'm a person of this community. Those, those are who I am. So what I do over the course of my life, it might change a lot of times, but hopefully who I am stays more consistent through that. And so when I left LA, I thought, gosh, I hope this doesn't change my career, but my kids and maybe I was influenced because my dad left early, but I'm like, my kids are my priority. And out of everything I was doing, I liked stand up the most. And I found out that I could do stand up, that I could take my kids to school in the morning, run, go rent a plane, fly to Milwaukee and do a show, get back on the plane, fly back home, get there at two in the morning, but I could get up at six, take them back to school the next day. And I literally did that for 15 years. just and, and I look back and go, when did I sleep? But doing that gave me 100 more days a year with my kids. And now they're 30 years old and they call or text me every day. Uh, so was it worth it? Absolutely, it was worth it. What were you like as a parent? Um, there was, a, I think, an article from a couple of years ago where you said you parented your kids differently based on their personalities and their Enneagrams. Is that right? <laughs> well, I didn't know about Enneagrams then. Yeah. But you have two kids, you know, yeah. and and you know that. I don't know how many you have, Jonathan, but my I have two daughters. They're they are literally the sun and the moon. The older one is is his been the advocate for poor people and the social justice person and the serious one since the day she was born. And the youngest one is the cheerleader and the sunshine that walks into the room. Same mom, dad, same, you know, village raising them couldn't be more different. Um, And so with my oldest one, if you punished her by telling her to go to her room, she was thrilled to death because she would go (laughs) lay on the bed and read three books at one time and be happy as a clam. Uh, Now, if you made the youngest one go to her room, that was punishment. You know, the way you punished the the older one was said, you've got to go with us to a high school football game. You know, (laughs) then she would she would scream at that. But um, so. 
But I love that. I, you know, I, I tend to think that about all human beings. I think we're all kind of masterpieces and none of us are exactly alike. And if you, you take the time to like really know somebody's story, um, you get to see all the different colors and the brush strokes. And so you, you can't treat them all alike. Um, I'm curious what what your career looks like now. Do you have plans? I know you have um, your first solo special in, I think, 24 years is streaming on Netflix now. Is that right? It is. I mean, I did. I never quit doing stand up, but we did like three blue collar uh, comedy tour movies. I did. I did one with. Uh, Bill Ingvall and Larry the Cable Guy, and then Larry the Cable Guy and I did another one. So I, I've been doing, this is the first time I've, I did one solo in a while. Um, and I and I still enjoy stand-up the most. Um, but, like, creatively, I still like doing different, like I I saw somebody had, um, that was drawing with like graphite, like fine detail stuff. And I'm like, oh, I've never done that. I'm going to try that. So like the Jeff way to do it, I go out and buy all the stuff and I sit down and and I do it. And now like I'm loving doing that. And people are like, I've got a list of people going, oh, I want want to be next on your list to, to draw something for me. Well, you know, that's a little creative thing I've never, I've never gotten to use. How can we see your art? Is there a place that it's posted anywhere? Do we do we do we get a sample? All right, Jonathan. Look, this is this is the most atypical podcast you've ever seen. Hold still. He's been drawing you the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, so I just <laughs> this is an idiot. I just ran across to the bathroom. Like I just drew <laughs> these two things. What? And my wife was like, "Oh, I want to frame those and put them in the bathroom." What? Wait. Okay, for people who are only listening... It looks like a photograph of a freaking elephant. It looks like a photograph. The detail is unbelievable. I You just picked this up, Jeff? Yeah, and so... What? We were in Africa, and I took this picture of this elephant, and so, and then I had taken this picture... Did you shoot it? Is the next drawing the shot elephant? No, I didn't shoot okay, it. Okay, good. <laughs> I did not shoot it, no. Okay. Uh, All right. Next one then, is a lion. Oh my goodness! I took his photo too and drew him, but I just like the detail, like wow. doing every area. Oh yeah, you know. So, how long does one of those take you? Um, a few hours. Uh, yeah. but it's very cathartic. Like I, you know, it's almost kind of mindless. So God gave you this talent too, and <laughs> we just didn't know. When I was a kid, I would have thought I would have been if you said if you were that I was going to do something creative growing up, I probably would have guessed it would have been an artist, but, and not oh. a comedian, but. You were just always able to draw that level of detail. Like that's miraculously detailed. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but like paintings, I'm not very good at painting. Um, I've tried painting. I'm not good at that, but like for years, cause I lived on planes. Like I would see somebody interesting in the airport and I would take out a little sketchbook and I would kind of just like, draw them with a pencil without them noticing. And then I would get on the plane and with pen, I, I have stacks, I mean, of, of cartoons where I've drawn people and then put like a far side caption on them at the bottom. <laughs> and so I have a ton, see, and this is like something nobody knows about me. And I have a ton of friends when they come over, the first thing they'll say is, go get your books. I want to look at, I want to look at the cartoon books. I want to look at the cartoon books. Maybe you publish the cartoon books. Well, it's a combination of two aspects of your creativity. Like that's so, that's so special. If you had to caption mine, <laughs> what would it be? Something about the beard, I think. Um, <laughs> oh, that's and maybe something that's you something you had found in it. You know. Uh, <laughs> This is the second, the last comedian we had on, we had Whitney Cummings on, and she literally said Jonathan's beard looked like a Santa Claus beard that you buy at Oz on the corner. (laughs) (laughs) She said, what is that thing hanging off your face? You know, I might draw him, and it's kind of more of a cartoon style, 
and say, you know, Jonathan found his missing left <laughs> earbud while he was scratching his chin, you know, or something like that. So that's awesome. I like that very much. But and and oh. Mayam, I you know, I. I get embarrassed because this is you guys asking me stuff because I love to know other people's stories. And so, you know, I would want to know your story of starting doing this as a child and looking back and go, what impact did that did that have on me? And, you know, for me, I... I always wanted a life in balance. Like I, I think from my time in LA, it's like I, I, I go. I don't want to lose the ability to take my kids to school. I don't want to lose the ability to go to the grocery store. I and and so you know, there's been so many things that I have done. Like I for. 12 years, I would get up every Tuesday at five o'clock in the morning and go, I would go teach like a small group, like a Bible study at, at the homeless mission downtown. And, you know, after a dozen years of doing it, like people would find out about it and they'd go, well, how come, how come I don't know that you do this? And I would go, well, I'm not doing it. So, you know, that i you know, but I, but I met somebody that was homeless and learned their story. And I realized this was something I needed in my life. I needed to be able to have these, these conversations with other human beings that were just as important as me and whatever their addiction was it. That was the symptom of something worse that had happened to them. And it was, you know, man, I'm so grateful for that in my life because it is the counterbalance between having a weird job when you go out in public with your family and people want to take their picture with you, you know? And it's like, okay, I need something on the other side of the scale to kind of, I don't want this to become my life. I want, you know, and, and isn't that what we all do? Don't we all kind of go through life? I, I imagine it like the abacus with the bead on it. You're like, too much work, not enough work, too much work, not enough work, you know. Um, that's the healthiest life. And, and you can be great. At, so I probably could have been more successful as a comedian, but it would have cost, cost me too much that I would have to give up as far as being a dad or a husband. So I, I made different choices. And that's what life is, choices and consequences. Do your grandkids live near you? Where where do they live? I picked up my two-year-old grandson at school. He's about 12 feet away on the other <laughs> side of the door there. Uh, so yeah, he lives about 15 minutes away. And he's two and a half, and he has a, a little sister that's uh, three months old. So Oh, wow. Yeah. Very tiny. So me being 65, and, and I tell my kids this, I said, I miss my 30-year-old body. I miss that body that didn't hurt when I woke up and, you know, but I would not trade my 65-year-old mind and soul to get my 30-year-old body back. And so I had gotten to the point that I thought that I kind of had life figured out, you know, that hey, good stuff happens in the struggle and it's not all good stuff and it's not all bad stuff. And and I really thought it had, I had it figured out and then I had a grandkid and I had no idea how impactful that was going to be. I had no idea I had that much untapped love inside of me because I really kind of made it a conscious thing every day. It's like, okay, love on people, encourage people, be nice to people, love on people. And Holy moly, this is such a sweet season. Um, I love these little kids. I mean, it, it, I was telling her that and putting down for a nap. I'm scratching his back. I go, I love you so much, buddy. Uh, you, you, y'all have got that to, to look forward to. It is, and you're going to remember, Degum Jeff Fox really told me this. Uh, it's the best. 
Jeff, it's just it's been such a pleasure to talk to you. And I hope you understand why we wanted to have you on. You're a fascinating person. You have a really beautiful journey. And I think um, especially the notion of being a, a person of faith and feeling like you've been, you know, directed to where you needed to be. And um, I, I think it was when we had Whitney Cummings on she mentioned, you know, that genes load the gun and the environment pulls the trigger. Mm. And that's usually said in reference to addiction and, and mental illness. But, mm. you know, hearing your story, it's kind of like genes loaded the gun and, you know, the trigger can also be pulled to, to so much beauty and so much hard work that you put into your gifts. And um, you've brought so much joy to so many people, including my own family. So um, it's really just a pleasure to talk to you. And, and we... We will direct everyone to uh, to your special, which is streaming on Netflix. And uh, thank you so much. And God bless you and all that you do. He, he does. And thank you uh, for having me. And then the next time around, I want to interview you. I'm happy. I'm happy to talk more. And uh, I was, you know, I was that kid who make another kid's laugh at the bus stop doing imitations of of teachers and students and um yeah, I I remember that feeling. I come from a very very you know complicated first generation American family, and so we used to say, "If you don't laugh, you'll cry." And so we did a lot of laughing and also a lot of crying. Well, you know, I say when I when I walk out on stage um, every night now, I say, I remind myself, which I do, that everybody I'm going to look at is going through some kind of a struggle, and it, it might be a financial struggle or an emotional struggle or a physical struggle. But everybody's going through one, and which is kind of like why I've always been, you know what, just be kind to people because you don't know their story. You don't know what they're going through. And I don't think laughter makes people's struggle go away. I'm not that naive. But I do think laughter is like that release valve that keeps the boiler from exploding. Um, and so if that's what my gift does, if my gift allows you to put your struggle on the shelf for just a little bit and recharge. You know, there's like Mark Twain. That's why I'm here uh, is hopefully, you know, that, that can be a little good thing for people. Laughter also bridges that 85% or solidifies it. You know, if we can laugh together. And I think there's something about your comedy and the blue collar comedy tour that does stretch across, you know, the divide in a way that really helps heal people and helps uh, bring the country together. Yeah. You know what? We've uh, somewhere along the way, we, we, we kind of lost the ability to laugh at ourselves. Um, and because w now we all have to be right. But when you have to be right, that means somebody else has to be wrong and, and people don't want to engage in something where they have to be wrong so they just walk away um but but i but, but here's what i believe we're all idiots everybody's family's crazy and nobody has it figured out if you if you've got it figured out you, you're lying i think everybody's life is a hundred times a day we're coming to forks in the road and we're guessing left or right Left or I think it's right's the right way to go. I think left's the right way to go. I none of us have it figured out. So so if you'll just admit that and free yourself from having to be right, then you kind of laugh at yourself. Gosh, it takes a lot of pressure off. I also feel like we can't we can't let you go without me asking about the baseballs behind you. Huh? Okay, so well, I've got all kind of weird stuff back there. I've got. One of my hobbies is I look for arrowheads in different states when I'm there. But baseballs, I grew up, a, I loved baseball when I was a little kid. And so when I started doing things like The Tonight Show or hosting awards programs or something, I would carry baseballs in my backpack and I would just get random people to sign them. And I have maybe some of the most eclectic, baseball. Not many of them are baseball players, <laughs> but I have like one section on comics and it's like uh, Milton Berle, Johnny Carson, uh, <laughs> you know, a Red Skelton, Carol Burnett. And you know, then I have another section that's musicians. So I have like Robert Plant and Elton John and the Eagles all on just individual baseballs. And so when people come in and look at them, 
they're like, wait a minute, Robert Plant played baseball? I'm like, <laughs> no, I met him at an awards thing one night. So, you know, it's, it's fun conversation things. I really enjoyed that. He is so soulful and wise. He's, uh, what a special guy. I mean, I think it's funny that he was nervous. Like, I don't know what he thought we were going to try and make him answer, like, calculus questions. I don't know what he thought. I mean, he's so self-reflective and has so much insight. It's interesting to me that he said he listened to or watched the Bob Odenkirk episode. First of all, it kind of freaked me out that, like, people watch our podcast or, like, see other people. Like, that's so crazy. Um, but I I really love that he um, he shared deeply about both feeling really, really blessed and really lucky. And I didn't feel like he was like bragging, but also really like truly humble. I think that I think that's what humility is. Like he's both he's not self-deprecating. He's not like, why me? I don't deserve this. He's just like a lot of things happened in my life and here I am. But it seems like he also does a lot of really good things with it. And I was very impressed by that. It seems like he has a genuine acceptance for the success that he's had. And, you know, he, he also feels extremely humble. I wondered, I, and we didn't get to ask him, I'm like, what is it like when he goes out in the world? Because he both is extremely recognizable, but also you put that guy in some cowboy boots, some beaten up jeans and a baseball cap. And he's like just any farmer that you would see out there. And, and maybe people don't recognize him. Well, I think it sounds like, I mean, the leaving L.A. thing. I didn't realize how much of a big deal that was. You know, when you hear about celebrities who are like, we have a ranch in Montana or I don't know where people go. Montana or Valerie name somewhere else people go. They have a place in in Kentucky or Texas or Wyoming. Um, or like, oh, we have a house in the, you know, in the um, in the Berkshires or the, <laughs> the Poconos, like it's the 1950s. I don't know where people go. But, you know, I think for him, like the notion is if he lived in L.A., he'd be much more immersed in this culture and his kids would be immersed in this culture. I mean, my kids are immersed in this culture. People who are not actors, their kids are immersed in the L.A. culture. So I think that was um, a really big deal, you know, for him to to go home, as it were. Um, yeah, I really, um, I just, he's a very quirky guy. You know, I really loved his notion that everybody was, you know, going straight. And he was like, I'm made to go a little bit, you know, not like that. That reminded me, also in the Bob Odenkirk episode of being true to oneself and knowing oneself enough to accept and to find that path if it's not what the traditional path is and it's, you know, more circular or, or more, that's not circular. What, what is this? We're, we're doing it's this wavy. hand motion. Wavy. We're doing it. It's, yeah, I mean, I mean, the notion is like it's a crooked path, you know, um, like the... And, that he can be unique and he can be himself. What I found fascinating is this notion that he listened to all of these comedy albums and he basically internally ingrained and built a structure for comedy in his head so that he could take his life experiences. A lot of people have to study and learn that, but just by listening and memorizing those albums and, and performing those albums to his friends at school, he had the structure like just downloaded. There's something I wanted to ask him, but I was embarrassed to ask him, so I didn't ask him. Like, it was a conscious thing, not like, oh, I wish I would have asked Jeff Fox where he, where he is. Um, I wonder if he, like, in his personal life curses, I wonder if he ever tried, I wonder if he ever tried to do sets that had cursing in them and was like, oh, it just doesn't feel right. I mean, I wonder if it was Jay Leno's suggestion to him of, like, if you, you know, if you do clean work, you'll always have work. But I'm very curious if it sounds like it's against you know, his religious and kind of ethical sensibility. And, you know, he seemed really pleased when I said that, you know, we listened to to Jeff and Larry's comedy. Like, that was the comedy we listened to, you know, in the car because I didn't want my kids, you know, hearing stuff, not just curse words, but things about, like, sex and, you know, often, like, mistreatment of women and things like that. And, like, so um, I really, I, I think he takes pride in that. But um, but I was just very curious if that's something, like, if that's his sensibility in general. But I felt embarrassed to ask him. I mean, 
It is your podcast. That's that's kind of, <laughs> this is the time and place to ask him stuff. I had a fantasy. I had a fantasy. Okay. I had a fantasy of me and Jeff Foxworthy on a stage. Because I was like, there can't be two people more different, you know, in terms of like where we come from and like, you know, the kind of comedy and like things like that. And I was like, I think that's such an interesting crossover. Maybe we run for president and vice president. Can I say something that you're going to get annoyed by? <laughs> Why should today be any different than any <sighs> other day? This is a vulnerable space. We're in a, uh, a podcast that talks a lot about communication and I'm about to step in it so people can enjoy that at home. Um, it felt like he wanted to know more about you. It felt I think it, he wants to be my friend. He fe- it did. He felt like a serious level of genuine curiosity and he, w- he was so present. You know, if you're just listening in audio, you may not really be able to feel what I was sensing. He was like, you know, what, what they call leaned in, not just... He was totally leaning in! And it wasn't just like proximity to the camera, but he had this like curiosity. He was present. You know, sometimes you speak to people, they're doing podcast tours and they're kind of giving you the same stuff and and you have to break through that as an interviewer to, to get their authentic self. But like, he was just so there. And he asked you a few times about questions about yourself and it felt like you were shy or standoffish. And I was like, what's, what was going on for you that, you know, you, you, you were leaned in, of course, because you're in the interview, but it, it felt like there was something else there that maybe you were shying away from. No, I just don't like to talk about myself. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think of our podcast as a place where like that kind of back and forth goes. We've had some examples of people asking things, but no, I really wanted him to feel special and, you know, and like he's our guest. Well, here's a new idea <laughs> is the notion of what is a podcast and what isn't a podcast. Okay. Can I- <laughs> this is the place where we break things down so that people don't have to and also where we make friends that people can also make friends. We can invite him back for an abbreviated episode anytime he wants, and he can interview me. You know what I wanted to tell him about? What? I wanted it when he was talking about the toenails and men keeping their toenail clippings, I wanted to tell him about your pinky toe and the (laughs) sand that is required to get that thing down to shape. That's TMI. If people have listened all the way to the end of this podcast and are sticking around for the conclusion. They deserve to wonder about my picky toe. What do you, you know, if they're curious right now, is there anything you want to tell them or we'll just leave it in the Yeah, uh, I'd like to tell zone. people, I'd like to tell women that you should not wear narrow shoes because everything will be fine. And then one day you'll be 43 and a podiatrist will say, oh, there's nothing wrong with your pinky toes. You just wore shoes that were too narrow for the past 35 years. And now that's what your toenails look like. They have, <laughs> they have thickened. To the, to point, the point where that they, they don't break look, a they traditional don't, no, clipper. No, no. They don't look like the other toenails. They're thicker. There is not a fungus among us. There's nothing wrong with them. There's not a medical condition. There's no cream, lotion, or potion needed. It just sucks to be your pinky toe because you wore narrow shoes. Valerie's laughing because it's true that they show you these shoes and they're like, you'd look great in these shoes, women. Well, they hurt your pinky toes after 35 years. There's nothing that an industrial sander can't take care of on your pinky toe. But in serious, but this is actually a serious. Uh, you make jokes at inopportune times, and everyone knows it. I do, but objectively speaking, when we have an audience, like when Miles is with us or another one of the kids, they laugh at those jokes. So it's only <laughs> you that gets upset at me. And Fred, when I do it during movies, although I was talking to Fred, uh, well, I, I tried to bring up this subject with Fred at dinner. Because he was just like cracking joke after joke after joke. And I asked him, Fred, are you open to uh, some feedback? And he said, he, he's, he got quiet for a second. And then he looked at me. He's like, no. So I didn't give him the feedback. But what I wanted to say was he was doing the thing at dinner that he gets upset at me for doing during movies. Oh, yeah. That's that's a really good thing for you to do as a grown up to say to a 15-year-old, that thing that you don't like when I do, when I interrupt your movies with jokes, you're doing it right now. I no, Jonathan. To- Gently bring his awareness. You know what's funny? 
when that happened the other night, I was perceiving that my child was being very sassy with me. And when you said, Fred, are you open to feedback? I thought you were going to say to him, just say yes to your mother instead of being sassy with her. And then she'll stop talking. But now that I know that what you were going to say to him was like, hey, you're making a lot of jokes like I do. I'm glad he said he wasn't open to your feedback. I think he would have appreciated it. You know what I would have appreciated? Him not being sassy and you not making jokes. The jokes are trying to bring the divide to heal the divide. They're trying to relieve the pressure cooker. And what, what, you know what we learned in this episode? If laughter is the reliever of, what did he say? The, laughter is the pressure valve release. What I learned, Jonathan, is that you are always under pressure. <laughs> you always feel like you're under pressure because someone who feels a constant need to release pressure means they're feeling pressure. And it didn't make me upset with you. It made me feel compassion for you because a situation that I may not perceive as stressful you may be perceiving as stressful. And so you may need to blow off steam, as it were, and release that. The fact that it's not shared by other people in your conscious contact is a different issue. All I hear is I have the green light to make jokes, and that's uh, good enough for me. How many times did we make Jeff Foxworthy laugh hard? Okay, you got him really, really well on the uh, Labrador going through the <laughs> cat <laughs> tour. <laughs> The, the St. Bernard going through oh, the cat Bernard. door. Yeah, not the Labrador. I the said I know what it feels like. I don't know what it looks like. He laughs so hard. Really, the only reason we have comics on is so that we can get them <laughs> laughing once or twice, and that validates our existence. From our breakdown to the one we hope you never have, we'll see you next time. It's Maya Bialik's breakdown. She's going to break it down for you. She's got a neuroscience PhD or two. One fiction, one and now she's going to break down. 